let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. I have a good friend, and he claims to be a movie buff. And we went out to lunch one day, we were enlisting our favorite movies, and on my list I included It's a Wonderful Life. And so when he finished listing his, I was stunned that it didn't make the cut. And I asked him why he didn't include it on the list, and he rather sheepishly admitted he had never seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life. I was stunned. I said, you've got, to f you've got to find a way to see it. I ran outside. There was a little, we were at a Denny's. There was a newspaper stand, and we were in California and Los Angeles. There were always these old theaters screening movies, old movies. Sure enough, I found a theater in Santa Monica showing It's a Wonderful Life. And I, I said to him, you are among the privileged. You are going to get to see this movie in a theater. You've got to go. It's, it's showing on Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever it was. So he said, all right, I'll go. I'll take my fiance. I'm sure she'll like it. Great. So I'll, I'll get back together with you next weekend. You tell me what you, th what you think of the movie. We sat down. I said, how did you like the movie? And he said, well, I thought it was a little confusing. There were these stars talking to each other, and some guy named Clarence gets wings. And at the end of the movie, this guy is getting all these presents from, it seems like, poor people, and he was accepting them rather selfishly. He said, I didn't get it. And I'm like, are you serious? So I began to explain to him why I thought the movie worked, and I started going through all my favorite scenes. Did you see the part where they're dancing at the high school over a pool, and the pool starts to open up, and they all fall in? And he, says, and he looks at me, and I can tell he's not really familiar with the scenes I'm talking about. So I started getting worried that maybe he saw the wrong movie. And so we keep talking, and, and I asked him, did you see this scene? Did you see that scene? No, we didn't see that. I'm looking at his fiance. You don't remember this either? And so finally she spoke up, and she admitted in a kind of embarrassed voice, well, we actually got there a little late. And I said, a little late? Well, how exactly... What do you mean by a little late? She said, I think we cost, co he got lost. <laughs> I'm like, you got lost? I'm like, in Santa Monica, we know Santa Monica well. He didn't want to admit to me that he couldn't find his way to the theater. But in fact, he got lost, and he, he, I said, well, how much of the movie did you see? And she said, I think the last five minutes. I'm like... <laughs> Well, of course the movie was confusing to you. If anybody were to hear that you went into a movie theater five minutes before it ended, sat down, and then complained that it was confusing, anybody would say, you're out of your mind. Because we understand in order to understand a story, you've got to watch it, you've got to read it, you've got to know it from the beginning. Right? Nobody sits down with a book by Mark Twain, opens up to the last few pages, and then complains that the book doesn't make any sense. Right? That the character development is just too confusing. Right? But everybody does that with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is at the back of the Bible. And so what do people do? They turn to the last few pages of the Bible. They look at this book that describes beasts and marks of the beast and dragons. And they complain, it doesn't make any sense. All right? Well, yeah, there's a reason the church has put the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible. The church expects that we've read all the other books in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. That's how we read the Bible when we come to Mass. We read the Old Testament first and then the New Testament, right? We're going to be looking at a passage here in Revelation 20 that is confusing and perplexing to a lot of people. And there are all sorts of different interpretations out there about what it means. But I'm going to suggest to you that if you really want to understand the book of Revelation, you've got to read the Bible from the very beginning. You've got to understand how the book fits into its larger, how the book of Revelation fits into its larger canonical context. You've got to understand how it fits into salvation history. All right, and so we're going to be looking at Revelation 20 against that backdrop.